The life of American novelist Carson McCullers was not a happy one to say the least. She faced constant and long-standing health issues from a young age, many personal tragedies, fractured relationships and a lifelong and profound sense of loneliness. That loneliness is the driving theme to her writing as well and very few writers can claim to have explored it more fully. It's obviously commonplace for writers to write what they know and in the case of McCullers, she wrote what she knew in such a way that her themes are still instructive almost a century on. So today on Out of the Page, we're going to look at the prodigious and tragic life of Carson McCullers, a writer who built an empire of loneliness. McCullers was born Lula Carson Smith in 1917, the daughter of well-to-do parents in Georgia in the American South. At school, she preferred the company of her piano to that of her schoolmates, and her parents believed she was destined for greatness. She initially wanted to become a pianist, but after contracting rheumatic fever in her mid-teens, she was unable to cope with the demands of practice. It was around this time that she began reading literature and considered pursuing it as an adult. When she was 17, she sailed to New York City with the stated intention of continuing to study music, but famously lost the money she'd been given for her college whilst on the subway. Secretly, though, she very much did intend to become a writer. And over the next three years, she studied creative writing while working a series of menial jobs, punctuated by time back in Georgia whilst recovering from additional respiratory illnesses. During one of these recuperation periods in 1936, she was bedridden for several months and came up with the idea for her first novel, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. She had her first story published the same year and also met an ex-soldier and her future husband, Reeves McCullers. They married the following year when Carson was 20 years old. The marriage was riddled with problems from the start, including alcoholism and a mutual romantic disinterest. Initially, they had an agreement to take alternating turns with one writing full-time and the other working full-time in order to support them. This never came to fruition, however, and in 1940, at the age of 23, Carson's first novel was published to massive critical acclaim. The Heart is a Lonely Hunter tells the story of a deaf man in a small Georgian town who, as he is unable to speak properly, becomes somewhat of an emotional outpost for the unhappy inhabitants of the town to turn to. It also has one of the best first lines you're ever likely to read in a novel. Her first book very quickly set the tone for her future writing, and she wrote her second within the space of only a few months. Carson and Reeves separated then in 1940, and she moved into a boarding house in New York City, which was to become something of a bohemian and literary meeting place. In 1941, her second novel, Reflections in a Golden Eye, was published. Reflections was quite a different novel to her first, and its plot revolves around a group of characters on an army base dealing with obsession, infidelity, and repressed sexuality. However, it continues very closely her exploration of lonely and misunderstood characters, something that was beginning to see its mirror in her own life. Carson and Reeves divorced in the same year, and she began to suffer from impaired vision and partial paralysis. She also began to work on her third novel. Carson, at least to her friends, was openly bisexual and pursued relationships with a number of women, although to very little success or reciprocation. And this lack of reciprocation is explored in Reflections in a Golden Eye. She also dedicated the novel to a female friend for whom she had unrequited feelings. At the end of World War II, she and Reeves reconnected and remarried and in 1945, the two of them moved overseas together to Paris. Her third novel, The Member of the Wedding, was published in the next year. The book explores the feelings of a misunderstood young girl in love with her older brother and dreaming of escaping their small town with he and his soon-to-be wife. The girl, quite unusually for the time it was written, is regarded as a tomboy. She uses a boy's name and comments about wishing to be able to switch between being a boy and a girl as it suits her. This isn't actually hugely different to the way Carson presented herself. She wore male clothing and pursued women openly. Many modern critics and biographers focus on this element in her life and see it reflected throughout her writing. And it does raise questions as to whether if she had have lived in a more progressive day and age, it may have influenced her life more positively. Unfortunately, something that wouldn't have changed was her lifelong health issues. She suffered a series of strokes in 1947, which left the left side of her body paralyzed. And she attempted to take her own life a year later whilst severely depressed. 
Her fourth book, The Ballad of the Sad Café, was released in 1951 and at the same time the theatre adaptation of her third novel was released to excellent reviews. Further tragedy followed in 1953 where Reeves initially attempted to convince Carson to take her own life with him and when she refused, took his own. And regrettably, it still doesn't end there. She returned to the United States where she would live with her mother and sister in a house in Nyack, New York. She tried to explore the story of her husband's death in her play The Square Root of Wonderful, which failed on Broadway and in 1961, her final novel Clock Without Hands also received mixed reviews. During this time, she had been suffering immensely and had spent long periods confined to her bed. The last five years of her life saw a series of physical injuries, cancers and extensive surgeries with long and painful rehabilitation periods and in 1967, she suffered her final stroke, dying at the age of 50. Writers and artists living tragic lives is something we hear about so often that I think the reality of what they went through is often lost on us. Carson McCars did not live an easy life by the stretch of anyone's imagination, and I cannot imagine the pain and suffering and isolation she must have felt through much of it. We can only really wonder if things might have been different had she lived in a different day and age, but what we can say for sure is that in her writing, she leaves a full and heartfelt legacy of what it means to be lonely and misunderstood. And that is something that even the most lonely and misunderstood of us can still find solace and connection so many decades later. Thank you for watching. I know that wasn't the most uplifting story, but I think in fairness and in respect, to the writers and artists we talk about on this channel, it's worthwhile discussing the reality and the tragedy of their actual lives. And of course, I would recommend her writing as with everybody else on the channel. If you haven't already checked out any of her novels, they are fantastic. Her first, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, is a spectacular place to start and is her most famous to date. So you can pick that up anywhere. And if you've read any and you have favorites, I wanna hear about them. So please put them in the comments. Please feel free while you're here to like the video and or subscribe to the channel. And thank you for everyone who has subscribed to the channel recently. I know I'm not the most frequent uploader, but I notice that you're there and I appreciate every one of you. So thank you. Have a good week or weeks and I will see you later.